<laughs> I'm Marcus Blake with That Nerd Show. We're sitting here with Dave uh, Levithan, um, talking about every day of the film and the book and other things that he has written. So we had a chance to see Every Day yesterday. Um, very, very interesting film. And I have to admit, I think the best part is you kind of leave A as an ambiguous, let people kind of decide on their own what it is. Mm -hmm. uh, but I want to kind of find out what your take on it is. Do you see A as a certain entity or just leave it as a complete mystery? I mean, I, my interpretation of A is, I mean, I see a is a person who doesn't have a body. Um, whether you refer to that person as a soul, as a self, as something else, um, is open to interpretation. But for me, A has a voice, just like all the rest of us, just doesn't happen to have a set body. And so people often ask me what my mental image of A is, and I really don't have one, because A just becomes whatever body A is in. Okay. Um, how, from book to film, but I mean, the original story, how did you come up with this idea? I figure, you know, I mean, every writer starts with a question, mm -hmm. you know, and it's usually what, why something is happening. But I mean, what was it for you that began this story? I mean, for me, it was, it was actually, it was two questions. So again, I was walking to work one day and just thought, what would it be like to wake up in a different body? Um, who knows what I was thinking about my own body at the time? <laughs> um, history will never know. but. But immediately when I started writing it, I knew that there were two questions. I mean, the first question from A's point of view is, yeah, who, who would you be if you weren't defined by your body? If you had no set gender, race, parents, DNA, if you could choose who you were because you changed every day, who would you be? That was interesting to me. And then from Rhiannon's point of view, the question of can you fall in love with somebody and, and continue to love somebody who changes every day? Right. That it's it's hard enough when your boyfriend grows a really bad mustache. Like what <laughs> what would it be like if your boyfriend woke up as a girl and then woke up like right. so so I feel that that I did not know the answers to either of these questions when starting the book and I wrote the book to explore those those questions and try to get at not definitive answers but at least answers in terms of the characters. At least to settle the answers for yourself. Right. Right. Well, and I think that's interesting you talk about, I mean, you have these two different perspectives of one that is exploring who they are, you know, like you said, without race, a body, and, and, and all that, and then the other person, that connection. I, this movie kind of reminded me uh, in the story of a couple of things. A, uh, the movie Joe Black, where, you know, you're on this journey with death, and death, death is exploring a um, little bit of the, you know, time traveler's wife and everything because you kind of it's it's I don't it's not really time travel that we know of it but it's again you're traveling from place to place and other people have explored this idea of entities I know there was that movie collateral beauty that came out last year which you know we all reviewed and stuff but again you have these two different perspectives of how that that connection and what is that connection that does make you fall in love versus your connection to everything not being bound by the limitations of body and race and stuff. Um, do you, I guess what I'm getting at is, do you, do you feel like that you can in some way define those connections or again is it just left for your own interpretations or meant to be ambiguous? I mean, I think, I mean, it is largely left to interpretation. I mean, I think the, the essential part of the love story and the in the book and in the movie, I think, to me at least, is that love isn't just saying I love you, it is about seeing the other person sure. and, and for who they want to be. And I think that is the thing that they're trying to navigate. And, and again, I think that the, the challenge is, is a supernatural, paranormal, unusual one for, sure. the, for the characters in the, in the movie and the book, but at the same time, it's also something we all have to grapple with in love um, to less extremes. Um, than in the movie, and I think that's what engages the audience and, and the reader is to put yourself in those shoes. Do you consider every day just, I mean, a, a true love story, or do you consider it more of a story about, you know, human connection and, you know, the different possibilities of that? I mean, I, I, I will selfishly say that I, I feel that love stories are stories about human connection. Sure. Like, that, that I, I, it is not, it is not a romance. It is not sort of a, 
it, a <laughs> girl meets question mark, <laughs> right? Girl loses question mark. Girl gets question mark back. Um, it's it's not about that plot. Um, it's very much it is about connecting with somebody, seeing somebody for who they are, and discovering how you can live together or not um, because of that. And so that, I think, is the, the most essential part of the love story. Right. Another interesting thing that I kind of took from it is um, whatever you believe in religion or how spiritual you are, that you know, there are other entities, there are spiritual guides, and you know, I think different cultures define it differently. But that A, may not necessarily be a person, but kind of a spiritual guide that's leading you in a different direction or with, the, or in her case, maybe the person you're meant to be with. Mm -hmm. um, is that something that you had an idea for or explored or am I just throwing out my interpretation? I mean, I think, I mean, it certainly, it is an interpretation I've heard a lot. Um, it's hard for me to say because the book is written from a's point of view. Sure. So when I wrote it, I was so much about the way A was seeing it that externally I wasn't honestly processing it and, and thinking about, well, what does this mean outside of this character? Sure. Um, and the movie certainly is helpful to me of sort of getting the distance to see that, and I can see that that, that is certainly the case. I think the question of the soul and sort of that we have this essential soul that through various stages, whether you were talking in life, in afterlife, how it, it permutates, um, I think that is something it explores. Again, I don't think it reaches any conclusions. I think sure. it is up to the, the reader or the viewer to sort of decide what, what that means. But I think, I think what is astonishing to me about the character of A is that A really is a soul that wants to do the right thing. Sure. That, that is guided not by malice or power, um, but just purely out of love and wanting to do best by what they are supposed to be doing. Why teenagers? I mean, you could have had characters at mm -hmm. different points of their lives. I mean, older, more cynical, right. you know, that kind of thing. But why, why teenagers? I mean, I think for, for two reasons. I mean, I think, I think in terms of A and Rianne, and I think that... Being a teenager is the first time you're forming your own identity, sure. separate from all the influencers around you. And so the notion of trying to discover who you are despite what your body or what the people around you are saying, I think really resonates with teenagers. But also specifically from A's point of view, I mean the whole, whole reason for the story to exist is that A has not connected with anybody since birth, basically, and has been living without connection and has this deep well of loneliness, but then finally connects with somebody and understands right. what that's about. And I feel that if you go much longer than 16 years without connecting with anybody, I think you would be so miserable and so despairing that it, it just would be a different story. I think sure. A reaches out to Rhiannon before it's too late, in a way, and so that's why it couldn't be, if A had been 30 years old and had never connected with anybody, I think it would be a very different character. <laughs> right. Talk about cynicism. Yes, yeah. yes. <laughs> An extremely cynic. So you, you, A, you basically have 16 kind of different characters that he's explored throughout this story. Is there a particular favorite of yours? Like, I mean, for me, I love the kid who had the overbearing mom, who was <laughs> yes, kind of like yeah, a Nazi George, mob yeah. and chasing right. her and everything, but he had such a great soul and had to learn facts. Um, yeah. And then, of course, the kid who was yelling about, this kid doesn't exercise, I thought that yeah. was kind of humorous. But is there a particular favorite of yours? I mean, I, I have to say that um, Nathan, the, the one who, who is in the party scene and is right. over and does the dancing, and then later on is, is the one who says that he's seen Satan's social media. <laughs> right. um, that, I mean, that particular performance, I love all the performances, but he really nailed it to me. And, and let me see my character in a different way because in in the book he's more confused and earnest. He's not funny, right? But but he definitely made the character funny, and I and I love that. Right. Now, you know, as the writer of Nick and Nora's Infinite Playlist, which is one of our favorites, we because we have this reoccurring theme about talking about great soundtracks uh -huh. oh, and yeah. how music really does make you know a movie or a story. How do you? 
is that you doing picking the soundtrack or I mean how do you work with music when it comes to your stories I mean my it's all indirect it's it's try to make the sensibility so clear in the novel that whoever's interpreting it can't go any other way and that okay. I think with Nick and Nora um, the soundtrack really was guided by uh, Pete Sollett, the director, right. um, who was great. And Rachel, my co-author, and I were friends with him, and we were talking with him throughout the, the filming process. And then when he assembled the soundtrack, I mean, it was basically like he had just went into my iTunes and picked songs. <laughs> like, it was like, oh, The National, oh, okay, yeah. Vampire Weekend, this is awesome. Right. Um, but so, so basically, he knew what I was listening to while I was writing the book, and then read it in the book and then basically extrapolated into the soundtrack, which was pretty cool. Do you write to a soundtrack in your head or? Always. I mean, okay. like, not in my, like, I'm blasting music every time I write, which is really interesting <laughs> because Rachel, my, my frequent co-author in our, our new book, um, our fifth book together comes out in April, um, she can't listen to music. And she loves music as much as I am, but she is of the the variety of author who if she is listening to music while writing she's distracted whereas for right. me i need it blasting because i just it fuels me so well you know it, it's funny because i again getting back to like nick and nora's infinite mm -hmm. playlist and then i saw a little bit of it in this movie you know you you pick certain songs that resonate with the characters and then there's this kind of combined effort of you know what's the medium between them uh like i mean i love the mixtapes you know from nick and nora mm -hmm. but then again you have this one great song like you said your character nathan and it, well that everyone kind of explores is that i mean for you do you have to pick certain songs that resonate with your character to really know them i mean it's interesting i don't i mean like for me the soundtrack is much more background music sure. um that certainly certainly some characters will be embodied by different singers so so i just finished someday the sequel to every day and when i was writing particularly rhiannon chapters there's a singer named julian baker who i love and she has this very vulnerable voice and that fit the character and so i would listen to her over and over again and I, again i wasn't listening to the words but definitely her voice filtered into the character um, so yeah, so sometimes that can happen, but it's not, I have author friends who choose like track list, theme song, <laughs> and know exactly right. what song is playing. For me, it's, it's a, little, a little dicier than that. Okay. Well, I mean, like I said, I mean, it's just, it's, it's a great pick of music. I, I know with Naganora's Infinite Playlist, there was a lot of bands that I hadn't heard of. I think that was the first time I discovered, you know, the band. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, um, uh, but, it, you know, like I said, there's just, kind of that it seems like it's perfect so i was mm -hmm. curious about how that you know who who picks that how it been how it works I mean, mostly i mean in my experience it's been the directors who are yeah. really the guiding light when michael came to me and, and said for for every day that the key song was going to be the thus this is right. the day which is a song from my high school years I right mean, which crazily of course now pop music sounds like it's 1987 again, so it's like yeah. it's all come full circle. <laughs> yeah. Um, so there are people, genuinely, people who've seen the movie who are like, oh, that's a great song. Like, which band is that thinking it's a new song? I'm like, it's actually older than you. Yeah, um, I'm, I'm starting to find that. I, um, I graduated in 96, and you know they have that new show on Netflix, Everything Sucks, yeah, yeah. Which, uh, which I found fantastic because of all the music. But I start hearing indie bands that are very eerily too sim you know, similar to things like the Gin Blossoms yeah, from 25 yeah. years ago, and it's like, that's no, not really new. It's right. just, they're, they're, it's their inner Bob Dylan or right. you know, just pop music from 30 years ago. It comes full circle. No, absolutely. You absolutely. remix it just a different way. That's, you know. Um, what, is, what is the one thing that you hope that people get out of it? And not just, because I know this is more geared for young adults, but I mean, for everybody. Uh, well, I think, I mean, the great thing about young adult media now is that adults consume it just as much as young adults. So we have to think of everybody. And I think for me, it really is what, the movie is so focused on that message of you get to decide who you are separate from your body and that you have to see people for that soul inside mm. and not for the right. body that is outside. And I think if people come away thinking about that or thinking about the relationships in those terms, I mean, that that is such a triumph for the filmmakers and for me. Sure. Now, I know, I mean, you know, the it ends 
you know, not to give a little bit of a spoiler to our audience, but I mean, it ends with, you know, A going and, you know, maybe one day they'll meet again and everything. Do you see them meeting at a different point in their life, like when they're older or middle age? The sequel comes out in October. <laughs> we and can't I give you. Say it'll, yes, it would be a very strange <laughs> sequel if they were not engaged in some way with each other. So that it's a spoiler on top of a spoiler. Um, but yes, yeah, so their their story is not over. Okay. Now um, at that nerd show, we are we're big on nerdy questions. Okay. So we 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 have a general question that we ask every year, but there's also uh, since you're an author, there's a separate kind of nerdy question I have okay. for that I want to ask you. Um, is there a particular nerd movie book anything that has influenced you? I mean, from sci-fi, fantasy, uh, action, just something that kind of was within our universe that was influential? I mean, again, I, I mean, with every day, I, it is that, that offshoot of science fiction, mm. which is like realistic, but with that paranormal conceit. And sure. so I, I think the holy grail of that is Groundhog Day. So I, <laughs> nice. I worship Groundhog Day. Um, <laughs> And it, again, it's 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 pretty much the opposite of waking up in a different body every right. morning. It's waking up in your same body on the same day every morning. But but certainly that I, I again I will that is the, the strongest influence going on here. Yeah, it's hard to believe that's actually 25 years old. I now. know it's crazy. It's absolutely crazy. <laughs> yeah, I, my cousin and I were talking about when our grandmother took us to go see that movie. And we kept singing the Sonny and Cher song like every day. <laughs> uh -huh. <laughs> like stop singing that song. Yeah. Um, the final nerdy question, and this is something we're asking everybody this year. Okay. Um, we, we, when it comes to nerd movie stories, it's always we're always big about the weapons, from a lightsaber to a Star Trek phaser, Thor's hammer, whatever. If you had a weapon of choice, what would your weapon of choice be? I mean, I, I think <laughs> a sense of humor. No, um, <laughs> no. I, so I, you have. There is a lightsaber sitting in front of me. I, I will say that that my day job is as an editor, and I actually edited 121 Star Wars books. And All right. One of the highlights of my life was I got to go down to the set of Episode Three. Um, while they were filming it and tour around and go to all the departments. So I actually did get to go to the prop department and um, was with just a few other people and the, the prop wrangler was like, hey, do you, do you want to hold the lightsabers? <laughs> and one of the guys who was with me was like, that is the most perfect sentence I've ever heard in my life. And I was like, <laughs> right. I agree with that. So we actually, they, they had these like metal suitcases and opened them up and in like this, the foam padding, right. they actually had the original lightsabers from the movies and let us pick them up and play around with it. So it was a bunch of like, guys and women in their 20s, 30s, and 40s, like, <laughs> literally with the hilts, like, just playing around with them and pretending to, to lightsaber fight with, like, Luke Skywalker's lightsaber. So I feel my weaponry peaked there, and I, I, I nothing will ever top that. So yeah. I'm, I'm going to go with that. And there is literally no shame being an adult wanting to do that. Uh, we right. did that because <laughs> we did a little red carpet celebration after The Last Jedi, and we were dressed as Jedis, and we had uh -huh. our Master Replica nice. lightsabers. And some people are looking at us like, no, there's nothing to be ashamed about. Right. And yes, we are going to make the noises with it. Absolutely. No, it's like <laughs> I, I have never made my like nine-year-old self more proud than another. Right. And, and, and you have to keep hold of that. Yes. Right? Thank you, George Lucas, for giving us the lightsaber. Exactly. Now I want the real one. Right. <laughs> so. Well, thank you very much for talking with us. Uh, it was a very interesting. It was a good film. Um, and you know, look forward to the, the sequel coming out and maybe another movie. Let's hope. Thanks so much. All right. <laughs> Thanks a lot. <laughs>